Step 2. Memory Memory Architecture, also known as MM. This architecture is also known as Sender Receiver. And this is the reason why. In the MIM architecture, we had both memories being the senders, and they were sending their photons towards the PSA. And there was an ultimately a bottleneck at the uh, memories. The, for time t-link, the memories were, uh, were, they were locked, meaning they emitted their photons, and then they were simply sitting there doing nothing, waiting for the classical message from the BSA. Now, if we place the BSA not right in the middle, but let's say closer to one of the memories, then one of the memories will not have to wait so long, and it will be able to act quicker, because the message from the BSA will reach it a little bit sooner. So we can take this architecture or this idea to its limit and place the BSA inside one of the memories. So now all these bell state measurements are happening locally inside one of the repeater nodes. This node then becomes the receiver of the photons, while the other node is still the sender. So the difference here is that now the photons have to travel uh, length L, the full distance between the two repeaters. But still we have the usual coincidence counter here at the BSA, and the classical message then has to travel all the way back to the sender uh, memory. This allows near instantaneous decision making for the receiver memories over here. And also, if our attempt at a bell state measurement is unsuccessful, one of the memories can immediately reset and uh, attempt again. So, in our analysis, we're going to um, assume different number of sender and receiver memories. And in particular, we're going to um, assume the sender has more memories than the receiver. And also that the T-link, the communication time between the two repeaters, is much larger than the clock time. Now the duration of one round is given by the following expression. Now the photons have to travel all the way uh, distance L and come back. So our T-link now has doubled compared to MIM architecture. And the time to generate all the photons is given by T-clock times the number of memories at the sender's end. And again, the receiver, after each attempt, it notes whether this uh, bell state measurement attempt was successful or failure and it has to keep track which of the mm, photons given by index i were entangled with which of the memories uh, in the receiver's end given by the index j. So this is what the control protocol for MM architecture looks like. It's a little bit more complicated. Here we have, as we said, two indices, i for the sender and j for the receiver. So they're both initialized to be one, and uh, they are both appropriately made to emit light. So J emits light and then checks whether the local BSA is successful. If it is successful, it means that um, memory J is entangled with uh, sender, sender memory I. It notes it in the message MI and increases its local index J by one. If it has no free memories, then it exits the loop and uh, sends the classical message to uh, the sender node and uses entanglement and also has to, it has to synchronize with the uh, duration of the round. If, however, it has free memories, then it can try to entangle the remaining memories with the mm, other incoming photons given by this index i. If there are no more photons, then again, we exit the loop. And this loop is properly synchronized to the, to, uh, the duration of the clock cycle. So over here is where the magic happens, where the memories um, at the receiver end are trying to entangle and with the memories from the sender end. So how do we measure the performance of, the, of this link? Uh, for the best performance, we have to assume asymmetric number of memories given by the asymmetric structure of the architecture. So if we set the number of memories at the receiver end divided by the number of memories at the sender's end to be approximately p, where p is still the probability of successful bell state measurement, then we are minimizing the number of memories that are used in the protocol. And this is now the expression for the average rate of an MM link. It's a lot more complicated than uh, the average rate for the MIM uh, architecture, so let's break it down what it means. This expression right here is the probability that exactly x attempts at BSA succeed. So we've got p 
to the power of x, so we have p successes, and exactly n sen minus x failures. And this can occur in a number of different times, quantified by this binomial uh, coefficient over here. In this expression here, given by the minimum between x and n receiver, here we are taking care of the fact that the memories at the receiver end might be full, and simply there is no more, uh, no more memories to entangle with, with the sender's memories. So we sum over the entire x, and then we divide by the duration of the round. And that gives us the average rate for an mm link. The upper bound is given when the number of memories are the same uh, in both repeaters, and is upper bounded by the following expression. It's the average number of photons um, that succeed at the Bell state measurement divided by the duration of the round. How do the two different links compare? So when we fix the total number of memories for both cases, then the MIM uh, architecture outperforms the MM architecture in terms of the average rate. But there are a few things to consider. The MM is much easier to install. So when you're thinking about deploying the network, we only have to build two uh, nodes, repeater one and repeater two. We don't have to go in the middle and install another node specifically for the BSA. This is also reflected in easier maintenance. When something breaks at the BSA, we can fix it at the repeater node. We don't have to go into the middle of the link and fix it there. And the rates are actually not that different. If we set the ratio of the memories between the receiver's end and the sender's end to be approximately p, the success probability of a, a Bell state measurement, then the rates are actually comparable. So we're not losing so much. However, the big bottleneck for the MM and the MIM architecture is the memory lock at the sender's interface. In the MIM uh, architecture, both of the ends were locked. MM1 is the receiver, which is not locked. It can act very quickly, but the, MI, uh, on, but the sender end is still locked. It has to wait for the signal to travel to the receiver and back. And we're going to take care of this bottleneck in the next step, where we consider our third architecture. See you there.